Today, I'm gonna to give you my race recap of the tunnel marathon and my BQ attempt. Twenty six point two miles, three hours, one minute, fifty two seconds for an overall pace of six minutes and fifty six seconds per mile. Uh, an unbelievable race. I had perfect weather, a perfect course and the perfect conditions to absolutely obliterate my previous marathon PR was which was three hours and 17 minutes to hit uh, past my goal today of three hours and 10 minutes, but just Everything lined up perfectly and uh, I couldn't have asked for a better result. I'm just absolutely amazed, absolutely thrilled. So I, I, there's a lot to, I've been trying to figure out how I'm gonna kind of distill all this, uh, but I'll, I think I'll just kind of try to keep it to the day talking about the race itself. So if you're looking for information on the tunnel marathon, this will be a good video for you. Uh, but for the day, going to the marathon itself, we had absolutely perfect weather. Uh, everyone says that Seattle is rainy and cloudy, but every time I've been to Seattle, it's been just absolutely amazing. Uh, although it did rain on Friday a little bit all during the day, but I was working. I just spent all day inside a Starbucks. And so uh, that didn't really bother me too much. But for, for Saturday and for Sunday, we just had absolutely gorgeous weather. Uh, for Sunday for the race, the temperatures, it was, a, it was very different because you park at the bottom of the mountain or the bottom of the hill. Um, and then you take a bus all the way to the top. Uh, there was more than a 10 degree difference between the parking lot at the bottom and the top of the race. And so it was like mid 40s when we got to the top, a little bit chilly. Um, but uh, my, my buddy who I was running this race with, who lives in the area and had run this race before, told me that there's a lot of waiting around that can happen if you get there too early. There are a couple of different parking lots that you can park at. There's a like a preferred parking. You pay, I think, 10 bucks or something, a, a nominal fee. And that spot is very close to the finish line, which uh, was useful at the end of the race. And uh, we parked right away. There was a porta potty there. There was only one right at that parking lot, but there was only three people, me, my buddy, and one other person that needed to use it at the time that we were there. We got there right as kind of like the last bus was leaving, but the last bus was pretty much empty. There was just a handful of other people on the bus. Everything was really easy. The bus driver didn't know how to get to the race. He kind of knew the exit we had to go back up uh, on to get to the race. But then after that, he was, wasn't really sure. Fortunately, my buddy kind of knew the way, but also there were signs. So it ended up being fine. The bus almost took a wrong turn, but we got there okay. Um, and then as soon as we got off, uh, I was worried because we were getting close to like race time. Race starts at seven. The bus didn't leave the parking lot till six. I had to drive, you know, 20 something miles to get to the starting line. Um, and so that took a while, but, uh, as soon as I got off the bus, I like walked up, got my bib and then, uh, they handed me an envelope. It had a bib, two gear, two gear check tags, and then another, and then two plastic bags for bag check. But I had brought, uh, the bag that I put my racing shoes in. Um, so I just kind of stuffed everything in there and tied my gear check thing to that. Um, and it wasn't like I had to go drop it off somewhere. There was just a big tarp and you could lay it down. Um, and so that was also nice because it was really cold and I had another layer on that I was gonna take off at kind of like the last minute. And I, was, it, I had my non-elite long sleeve on and I thought I would just kind of take it off and pitch it right before the race started. But instead I just took it off and put it, stuffed it into my gear check bag because I could just walk over to the area where all the gear check bags were. So that was so that was really nice um, and very convenient to be able to do it that way, something that you can really only do in a smaller race like this. Uh, the race started 
promptly at seven o'clock, 7.01 according to my watch. The one thing that I noticed, and maybe I missed it, um, but there was no national anthem before the race. So that's the first time I've been to a race in a long time that didn't have that. Uh, but I think everyone appreciated that because for this race, you run the first two miles, well, you kind of run an out and back and then you run directly into a tunnel and the tunnel is pitch black. So everyone had their hats and their headlamps on. So I think for the anthem, then everyone would have to undo it and then hurry up and put it back on before the race started. So maybe that's why they don't do that. Uh, but there were American flags uh, at the start and at the finish uh, everywhere. So it wasn't any sort of, in I don't think there was any intentional slight there. Uh, but we, we got into the tunnel, but before then we kind of, you run through the parking lot and then into some, like a gravel road to get towards the tunnel. But that part there was, it was all rocks, almost like a, a rocky riverbed. And I was getting really nervous because I'd worn the Vaporfly next for this race. And I was like, oh, if the race is all like this, I'm going to be in big trouble. Cause I was, you know, you would sink into the rocks and it's kind of, you slide around a little bit. Uh, but that was the only part where I had any real concerns. Uh, about footing we got into the tunnel and it was just amazing the the tunnel entrance is gigantic and it looks like you're going through a, an enormous portal and uh, it gets very dark very quickly and then everyone's just relying on their headlamps as soon as i got in there i couldn't tell if my headlamp was on and so i was like kind of putting my hand up to see if the lights were on uh and then i noticed that like i had set it up so that the headlamp was looking like straight out but that wasn't really all that helpful. I wanted it to look down. So I tried to adjust it. And the moment I touched it, it just popped off the headband and I, I just lost it. I let it go. Um, but there was enough other light around me that it wasn't uh, an, any sort of issue. What I did notice going through the tunnel, there was a slight downhill grade for a long, a large portion of it. It's about two miles in the tunnel. Maybe about over a mile of it is, I think, flat. But there's parts of it that are downhill as well. And in the beginning portions, the the road uh had a pitch to it and so i was running kind of on the right end near the wall and i was running kind of at an angle so if you are running through the tunnel try to stay through the middle for the beginning portion it does level out towards the end so then you can kind of spread out a little bit more uh, but other than that running through the tunnel was uh, really amazing um, the camera doesn't do it justice because it just can't pick up what's going on in there well enough with the low light but it's a surreal experience to run in there we come out of the tunnel and then at the tunnel that's where your second gear check bag a little shopping bag kind of comes into play and then you can take your headlamp off and whatever else you want to pitch at that point there was a a guy with a flatbed or a pickup truck with a tailgate down and um, you could put your stuff in there. A lot of people would like stop, took off an outer layer and stuff. I stuffed the what was left of my headlamp and my two disposable gloves that I'd picked up at the Indianapolis Monumental Marathon uh, Race Expo. Um, I had that in there because it was chilly in the morning and I throw that and I threw I like literally threw it as I was running. I didn't really care. All, everything I had in there was disposal. I didn't care if I found it at the end or not, um, but I think I made it into, into the truck. Uh, so then I did that and I kept going and then you got greeted to some more amazing views as soon as you passed that truck. You know, at that point, I'm just trying to get my bearings, getting used to the downhill. I knew it would be a significant amount of downhill going into this race. Uh, but I didn't really know what that meant, like physically what would that correlate to. Uh, I knew that the grade in terms of the decline was fairly uniform and gradual. And so like this was my first exposure to it. And it really threw off my pace. Uh, my goal for the race going in was to run a 310, which was my BQ time, um, for the first half, just to kind of keep it nice and easy. And then if I'm feeling good, after the first half run a 305 pace, ending at somewhere around 307 and a half. It was kind of the goal. I figured that would be a good buffer in case there's a lot of people qualifying this year and I anticipate that there will be um, to kind of keep me on the safe side uh, of that bubble. Um, but like as soon as I was running, I was just kind of running with a group and I was running around a lot more people than I was expecting. I found myself at about seven minute miles and uh, that is 15 seconds per mile faster than my plan going in but uh the other thing that i had with me was my stride foot pod and the thing about the stride foot pod not only does it help you with kind of distances where there is no gps like through the tunnel but it also gives you a power reading and when you train with it over time it kind of figures out 
what you're capable of doing, and it can give you predictions of what power level you should be at to run, say, a marathon. And so going into this race, Stride had told me, and I'll do a much deeper review of Stride coming up now that this marathon's over, but it had told me to do like a 245. And that's just kind of an arbitrary number. I don't think it corresponds to any sort of metric value, but 245 is the number, the Stride number. And uh, I was running at like 260. And I think plus or minus 15 is kind of a, the larger range of like, oh, you're mo working too hard. And so uh, I felt good running at 250 to 255. So I was kind of running there. And that put me um, in the seven minute miles, just about under that, a little bit under that range. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to kind of go with it and, and see what happens. Sometimes I found myself all the way up to 260 and I felt like that was a little bit fast. I was working, it felt good, but I was like, I don't know if I could keep that up for 26 miles. So I kind of would back off a little bit, but I did find myself hitting that 260 number and sometimes even more than that a little bit uh, frequently. By the time I got to the half marathon point, and I think it was about the half marathon point because there was only mile markers for this race. There wasn't, uh, some races will have, marathons will have like the 13 mile marker and then the half marathon marker at 13.1 miles. Uh, just to kind of demarcate that. Uh, and there were no like other chip timer things. So like, unfortunately there's no official splits for my 10 K or 10 mile or 15 K or, or half marathon or anything like that. Uh, but about where I thought where I was at for the half marathon, I looked down at my watch, uh, because I was going to mainly go off of that for my overall time. Uh, since I knew I needed three hours and 10 minutes, I figured using just my watch, like the clock would be a really great way of figuring out where I was and, and kind of where I stood. Uh, no matter what my GPS or stride were, was telling me how I was doing. And I thought I had crossed the starting line about 7.01, maybe 7.02. And it was like uh, like 8.31 or 8.32, maybe 8.33, when I looked down at about what I thought was the half marathon point. So that was like an hour and a half, uh, hour 31, hour 32 for a half marathon, which is technically a PR for me by about, I think, two or three minutes. Um, but I think if I would have had time to race a half marathon in this training cycle, which I didn't, uh, I think I would have been shooting for 130. So I think that still that was really fast for me. Uh, but I was feeling really good about it. So I thought, you know, maybe this is a day where I could go shoot for 305 and then see how much lower I can get. So I kind of just kept with it. And I think that ended up being a little bit of a mistake, a little bit too ambitious there because, uh, for a lot of those middle miles from like mile like eight through about like mile 14 or 15, I was with a really strong group, uh, like four or five other people that were all kind of running the same pace. And I think I just kind of totally messed it up because I was like weaving in and not weaving, but like kind of in between them a lot and just jumped into the middle of this pack. Uh, but they were rock solid. But at about like the 14 mile mark, after I'd taken like my second gel uh, around mile 12, then I was bouncing off the walls. There was an eight station at mile 11. Then I took uh, a, um, a Martin at mile 12. And I was just, the scenery was great. I was like overloaded on sugar and I was just bouncing off the wall. So by mile 14, I decided I would pass them. And then from then on until like about mile like 22, I was, I was just mostly by myself. I wasn't by a lot of other people. Um, and, uh, I think it would have been better if I kind of just stayed with them a little bit longer looking in retrospect, but overall, I, I really can't complain with the overall result. I had a great day, but the other reason why I think it would have been really good to stay with that pack was, uh, from like about mile 12 or so when I was like really hopped up on sugar, there's, I think a little bit more of a significant decline. And so the temptation is to run a little bit faster, which I did. Uh, and I kind of lost track of my pace and I lost a little bit of restraint and discipline at that point. So I did pick up some time in those miles, but I think that it would have been better to hold back just a little bit uh, so I wasn't so tired in some of the later miles. I'm not sure when I took my third gel. The third gel that I took was the Huma. Um, and I'm glad that I put it there. Maybe I should have put it as my second one because already by the time I had kind of crossed the half marathon point, my left hamstring and buttock were, were starting to really tighten up and I was worried that that was maybe a dehydration issue. Uh, there are aid stations like every about two or three miles in this race. And uh, I took Gatorade at every single one. Uh, we were spaced out enough and uh, the number of people on this course was small enough that I really didn't, there were no traffic jams in any aid stations. I could kind of 
usually I walk jog through a lot of the aid stations because number one, I want to make sure I get in the liquids, but number two, it's always like kind of dangerous because there's so many people weaving in and out. But for this one, you know, I could kind of just keep running through, uh, although I slow down a little bit to pick up the Gatorade. Uh, but even then taking more Gatorade than I normally do, I felt like maybe I was sweating too much. Um, so I did take the Huma there. I thought it was good to take. Um, but at that point, somewhere around like mile 15 or 16 or so, I started noticing also that my feet were starting to hurt. And it was unusual because I was in the Vaporfly next, more Zoom X foam than any other shoes ever had. It wasn't the pads of my foot that hurt, which is what normally happens in other shoes in, in marathons or long runs. But it was kind of not my heels, but the parts of my feet that were towards the back. So I think it was the heel drop, which is, I believe it's an eight millimeter for the Vaporfly next or maybe it's a 10 millimeter. And then running downhill, I think I was hitting more on my heels than I normally would in a shoe like this. And so um, I think that impact was unusual for me because I don't think I usually spend that much time on towards the back of my foot, but I think I was a little bit more because of the downhill, which was substantial. Um, and so that was starting to not hurt, but I was like, oh, I feel, I feel this. Uh, and it got to the point where like I was really enjoying when there were some bridges that were dirt and rocks, but some that were just paved. And I really liked those. And when I was on those, I could feel the bounciness of the Vaporfly next and the Zoom X one. And I really loved it. And I felt like I was, ooh, I was moving much faster through the pavement. And then I was slowing back down a little bit uh, on some of those dirt roads. Uh, but I was starting to feel it there. And also something that started happening right around mile 20, right around 21, um, was that uh, my right hip was really starting to hurt. And I found myself thinking, well, maybe uh, I need to adjust something. There's something happening because of the downhill that's hurting my hip that my hip isn't used to. So I tried like shortening my stride a little bit, picking up my knees a little bit, just doing like other little tweaks and things. Maybe I alter my stride a little bit just to take some pressure off of the, not literal pressure, but some figurative pressure off of some of the muscles that have been overused for the last 20 miles. And that seemed to help like a little bit. We also hit a flat spot right around there. Um, there were a couple of turns and some flat spots as we walked, ran through like a park and there was a lot of crowd there too, because that was one area that a lot of crowd support could be there. But it was a flat spot in there and that felt good too, because that also just worked some different muscles uh, than had been, been used. And so that was a nice relief. But it was also a concern because I was like, oh man, we've been running so much downhill. I think now it must be flat for the next like six miles because I couldn't remember what the elevation map was gonna say. Um, and I was like, oh man, if, if this is flat for the next amount of time, I'm not sure. Cause my pace slowed down substantially as I was going through some of the flats. Um, and uh, I, was, I was really worried about it um, because also by that point, my, my stride was telling me a number that was very different from the mile markers. And so I think I was off at some point, like by about 0.35 miles. And then I would just hit the lap timer and I thought that I'd be fine for the rest of the race and I could just go by the lap timer. But then it went off, it became even further off by another like 0 0.05 miles or maybe 0.1 miles. And so like, I was like a half mile off on whatever my watch was telling me in terms of distance run versus where I was on the mile markers. And so I was having a hard time figuring out like how much time do I have left? I was looking at my watch, trying to do the math in my head. I'm like, we started at 701, I need, three hours and 10 minutes. So I need to be there by 10 o'clock and 10 minutes. And I was looking and I was like, oh, it's like 940. I have 30 minutes left. How many miles do I have left to run? And how, how much can like the wheels fall off? And I still make it. Like if I have to walk at all, or if I'm like just crawling in, will I still make it? So I was doing all this math, like worst case scenarios. And uh, fortunately at that point, uh, the downhill resumed and I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's a lot nicer. So I was back on the downhills. And then at that point, uh, I had been running alone for, for so long. I finally got passed by someone. I was expecting a lot more people to pass me, but I got past someone and it ended up being the women's champion. Uh, so who I'd been running with in that pack right around that middle of the race. Uh, and she looked so strong and she was just trucking along and she, I tried to keep up with her. I was like, okay, maybe I could just keep up with her. I'll ride her shoulder, uh, all the way in, but she was moving way too fast. And I, uh, after about like five seconds of that, I was like, Nope, I'm going to just let her go. Uh, and I was still back to thinking, okay, well maybe, maybe I'll just, uh, do my seven minute, 30 second miles. 
uh, and I'll, I'll I'll try to make it in. But uh, not long after that, where I was like about at the point where I was like, I, I don't know where I am. This race never seems to be ending. I don't understand how there's so much downhill. I was just so confused and disoriented. At that point, we hit another flat spot, but at that flat spot, I could see the finish. I can see the finish. And it was, uh, I was like, it was like seeing an oasis in the desert. I was like, thank goodness. And you could see it from, I think, from before the 26 mile mark, or maybe right around there. And I just love the way that this race finishes because it's nice and flat. You could see it for a long time. There's crowds because it's a point to point race. It's not like there's tons of crowd support along the way. Although that being said, there was a lot of crowd support along the way, much more than I was expecting. Kudos to all the people that are out there. Uh, and thank you so much for being out there. Volunteers as well, people at the aid stations, it was amazing. But as you're coming down the, the, the last shoot, there's just people on both sides everywhere. It's, it's uh, really uh, invigorating. I was like, I only got a little bit left to go. I can make it, maybe I can hit that 307 mark. Uh, and I'm running, I got my selfie stick out and I could hear people like, oh, this guy ran with a selfie stick. And so that, that was pretty funny. There was a lot of rumbling about that. They're like, what is that guy doing? Uh, so that was really funny. Uh, it made me laugh a little bit on, the, to the extent that I had the energy to laugh. Uh, made me laugh a little bit on the inside as I was crossing the finish line. And then as I got closer, I'm looking at the clock and it's saying three hours and two minutes, like the for gun time. And I'm like, that can't possibly be right. And I'm looking down at my watch and I, I don't even remember what my watch said, but I was just like, what is that thing saying? I don't understand. And so I crossed the line and I'm like, dying my legs are given out the instant i stop running my inner thighs from like kind of like uh my groin all the way down to my knees just start burning and they're like they were just like they were like barking dogs i, I couldn't ignore i couldn't hear anything that lady that was asking me about the selfie stick i kind of heard her and that also kind of made me laugh but i was like i think it's a selfie stick i ran with it most of the way well i ran with it the whole way but i didn't film the whole time i'm just trying to explain like how how it works um but i'm like but but my legs are just on fire i couldn't i didn't understand what was happening or why that was and so that was just incredibly uncomfortable but uh i got a medal and uh i um was looking back and i finally stopped my watch uh after like a little while i don't know how much everything's kind of a blur and uh i realized that i had hit the time and i hit the time by a lot and uh it was um overwhelming it was overwhelming i didn't i just didn't know uh I, didn't, I don't even know what i was feeling i was kind of very numb i was very tired uh and um i was just uh, hands on my knees and uh just trying to catch my breath for a really long time and at some point i looked around trying to figure out is there a place i can go get an official time i tried looking on my phone to see it the, the results weren't like posting live or anything. I could only see last year's results. So I was like, that's not gonna do it. Uh, but eventually I found out by the, the finish line, there was a booth where you can go look up your number. I typed in my bib and my official time was 301.52. And I was just absolutely stunned. I thought I was coming in five minutes, six minutes later than that. And I took a picture of like the little slip and I'm glad I did cause I lost that little slip of paper. I don't know where it went. Um, after I took that picture and I intentionally took it covering the some information on there because for whatever reason when I signed up I'm sure it was user error uh, they had me registered as a female and so I actually I guess technically for a very very brief moment because I I told them about the error and they I think they corrected it right away uh, for a very brief moment I had finished second among women in that race uh, the woman that I told you about the women's champ that had just like burned by me. She had finished uh, about a, a, a minute uh, ahead of me. And so uh, she did a fantastic job, uh, but I was in second place for a little while. It turns out that ultimately I finished in 30th place uh, of all runners. So I'm feeling really good about that. And then looking through some of the results of the other people that had finished ahead of me, uh, one of whom was someone that had met up for the uh, Kofuzi Run Club in Seattle, Garrett. He had come in at 2.58 or something like that, amazing time. There were uh, a lot of people in their 40s uh, in this race who had run uh, under three hours. So that's uh, really, really amazing and very inspiring. Those guys are just super tough and uh, I hope to be in that category. Sunday. I'm not in a hurry to try and break uh, three hours right now. 
it's not something that I'm looking to do in 2019. Uh, but you know, uh, maybe that'll change, but for now I'm just still very, very, very tired. Um, but, uh, the, after, uh, the atmosphere after party was great. There were so many people that were qualifying for Boston at this race. Uh, there was a lot of emotion, lots of hugs, lots of cheering. Um, and, uh, my buddy was telling me that this race is more of a trail race than it is a road race. And I didn't really understand what that meant, but afterwards there was a huge spread of food. There was watermelon, cookies, chips, uh, all sorts of other fruit, bananas. Uh, it was just really nice. Uh, not something that I'd experienced before in the road races that I've done. And then there was this huge like ice bath tank, like a giant adult sized kiddie pool. Uh, that people could stand in like above their knees in cold water. I didn't get in there. I can't imagine having something like that, like a race in Chicago. Uh, but it made complete sense out there. Um, and it was just great people, a great event. The race was run magnificently. I just had, I can't recommend this race enough. Uh, the amount of downhill is uh, not to be underestimated. It's substantial. Um, I, I would say if you're just going on pace and you're trying to figure out for me, you know, I ended up running uh, almost 20 seconds a mile faster than kind of what I think my regular like flat course speed would be. So realistically, I think that I'm more of like a 307, uh, 308 guy if I was on a flat course. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to shoot for qualifying for Boston again on a flat course uh, in Chicago when I run that later this year. So uh, I'll have another crack at it uh, to do it on a flat course. Uh, but it's nice to kind of have the confidence booster of having a great day like this uh, on a well-organized, well-executed event uh, with perfect weather and just otherwise perfect race conditions. Uh, I did run in the Vaporfly next just to kind of wrap up on some of the equipment and other questions that people have had. Uh, I ran in the Vaporfly next. Uh, they were great. Uh, I, my other shoes that I had brought for the event were the Carbon Rockets. I think those would also have been fine. Uh, because the the lack of a heel drop on there, I think would have helped because I think the heel drop on the vapor fly next ended up being a little bit of an issue and causing a little bit discomfort because there was just too much shoe back there. Um, but people were running in Hoka's, were running in Brooks, Saucony's, other Nike shoes, lots of other vapor flies. And I, I think that the shoes are kind of less important for a race that's this much downhill. Um, but these shoes definitely took a beating and I wish I'd taken a picture of them like right away because I feel like the rubber has kind of like bounced back a little bit since uh, the race on Sunday. It's now Wednesday. Um, but like, yeah, this is all just kind of beat up. Some of the rocks definitely poked a little bit at this rubber outsole. There's dirt all up in some of these grooves up here. Uh, the Zoom X itself, the exposed Zoom X is doing a lot better than I thought it would at the end. Uh, but yeah, it kind of took a beating as well. It wasn't, I don't think it was a bad idea to run in these shoes. I don't think these shoes are trashed or shot after running in them. I wasn't the only one to run in Vaporflies or even Vaporfly next. I saw another pair out there. Um, and so uh, it was a great shoe for me and they held up well, it was really good. But I do think that the stack height may have been a little bit of an issue because after the race, once like my inner thigh stopped burning, what bothered me was like the ligaments around like right above my ankle. And I think that was a stack height and like stability issue. I think I also have weak ankles from running so much road and like flat surfaces all the time. So that just could be me or it could be the stack height or it could be the fact that I was running downhill or all three of those things. Um, the other thing that I was running in that you guys asked a lot of questions about with my, were my pants. I wore uh, Compression Half Tights by Roadrunner Sports. Uh, that was not a sponsored product. That's one that I bought myself. I actually bought two of those because I like them so much. The reason why I like them so much is because they're great compression shorts, but they also have two really wide pockets, one on each side, so I could fit the four gels that, and my phone because they encourage you to bring a phone because there is usually several miles between aid stations. But that being said, there's always an aid station kind of when you need an aid station. So it's very strategically placed, very well done. Um, but I could bring my phone with me as well. Um, so I had my phone and four gels the entire time. And those pants are, are perfect for that. Um, the gray color, I like the gray color a lot. But, and I don't know if you noticed it through some of the footage, when you're sweating in a pair of pants that aren't black, it always looks like you peed yourself. So I definitely had that at the finish line where it looked like I had peed myself quite a bit. Um, 
but the shorts are, are, are really great, and I do like them quite a bit. I ran in a Nike Aeroswift singlet top, which uh, was quite expensive. It was $60, which seems like so much money to pay for a tank top. There's so little material there, but uh, I, I love the material that's on there. It's very minimal, um, and uh, it held up perfectly. It did exactly what I wanted to do. I did not feel hot. I didn't feel like I had like a wet you know, rag on me as I was running, which can so often happen with other singlets uh, or tank tops. So I thought that was uh, well worth the money uh, for that race. So um, that's kind of uh, the gear that I had on. And um, I had just a, a great time running this event, uh, a once in a lifetime kind of experience to be able to qualify for Boston uh, in scenery like that. I was just constantly looking around how beautiful it was. There were times where I just wanted to stop and take pictures because it was just so beautiful out there. So hopefully I'll get another chance to run out there at some point in my life. I'm not sure when that'll be, but it was just an absolutely incredible day, an absolutely incredible race. Um, and there were definitely some dark times during that race where I felt like, man, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. But I just kept thinking back to all the support that you guys have been giving me in the days and weeks leading up to this race. Uh, I didn't want to let you guys down and I knew I had all of your support and I knew you guys were rooting for me and that was uh, an indescribable feeling. It was a very strange feeling, a very indescribable feeling, but uh, so uplifting and uh, it definitely helped me get over that finish line. So I can only thank you guys uh, again. Um, it's been great to have you guys running with me. Uh, for this a lot of you guys were commenting that you know I should have put the camera down I could have gone sub three if I didn't bring the camera but for me and I, I think you guys have seen it from the comments um, It doesn't matter to me if I could go faster without it because I, the way I see it uh, Being able to make these videos is motivating to me. Well, no, not only that it's distract It's a nice distraction like around around my miles like 15 through 18 where I'm like oh, I'm dying I'm bored and I just my mind's telling me to quit to just start filming stuff is kind of a nice way to distract myself. But in addition to that, like on the day to day, on the week to week, on the month to month, the idea that I want to make running content, that I want to show you guys my process and what I'm going through, that I'm just a dude that runs a lot, I'm not gifted, uh, to be able to show you that whole process um, is motivating to me. I wouldn't even get to the starting line if I didn't have the camera with me and show you guys and bring you guys along. So it doesn't make sense to me to not bring the camera for the race, it all, it all, it's all part and parcel. And at this point, I really don't know if I can run all that faster without it. And so um, I'm always gonna try to bring it. I think as the races get more and more crowded, I don't think I'm gonna be allowed to bring a 360 camera on a selfie stick when I go to Boston, but I'll bring a GoPro, I'll bring something. I'll always find a way to bring you guys along with me because I wouldn't be there without you guys. So I'm not gonna be there without you guys. So that's just the way I see it. So uh, sorry, this is such a long video. Thanks everyone so much for making it all the way to the end. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. I'd love to talk to you guys down there. Yo, what's going on?